time to study on the book of Psalms. And I hope, we'll hope that we gain some great insight into the book of Psalms itself. And a better understanding of what the book of Psalms is. Now today we're going to begin a whole new Bible study series. And we'll see where this takes us. Because I don't have any set time limit with any of our series. We just go and want to feel God's done and we stop. And we move on to what he tells us next. But today we are going to start our study on the church. So if someone would please read Acts 7.38. Acts 7.38. And if you want, it's right at the top of your notes. There are notes on the back um, communion table if you need them. But Acts 7.38. So the word church, this is the only time 
are the only times that we find it located in Scripture in verbatim, as in C-H-U-R-C-H, church. The God, now when we look at it, we're going to move on to looking at the law in the church. And when I say the law, I mean the Ten Commandments, the religious laws, all those that were put in place in our four favorite books, or five favorite books, well, I guess four, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, because those are the ones that discuss numbers, the laws, and all that fun stuff. So when we're looking at the law of the church, because the thing is, are we under law or are we under grace? That is always the argument back and forth. And which one is greater, under the law or grace? Which one is more significant? When we look at the law itself, Jesus Christ was born under the law. If someone would please read Galatians 4.4. 4. Galatians 4.4. 4. So he was made under the law. The law is extremely important because for the Jews, that was what dictated their social life, their economic life, their religious life, when it comes to their temple activities, the sacrifices. The law dictated everything. The problem with the law was it was a supernatural thing or a spiritual thing, but the Jews tried to fulfill it through the flesh. And you can never fulfill the law through the flesh. You cannot fulfill something that is spiritual or something that is fleshly. But Christ was born under the law. And one of the reasons he was born under the law was this. Because everyone that he came to redeem was under the law. He didn't die on the cross yet. He wasn't the sacrifice for everybody's sins. So before he could fulfill the law, he had to make sure that he was born under the law because not along with not only was he the sacrifice, but Jesus Christ, you know, endured everything that we endure. He was tempted with the same trials and temptations that we are. He was in every way tempted. And if the people under the law had to be brought to God, well then Jesus Christ had to be gone under the law so he could go through the same thing they went to went through as well. Now, does that mean that he superseded it? Well, when we look at his parents himself, even they were under the law. We find this in Levitic Leviticus. Luke chapter 2, 22 through 39, and we won't turn there and read it, but it is there in your notes. But if you learn how to take a guess, what's happening in Luke chapter 2 with Mary and Joseph illustrating that they're under the law? Any guesses? Now I'm starting to rock brains, I know. I'm just trying to pull here and there. But Luke chapter 2. Well, let's state this. If Luke talks about the birth of Christ, because we know that Luke records the, wife, the shepherds coming to him, what chapter would that be in? Or what chapter do you think it would be in? It'd be in chapter 1. So, when we're in chapter 2, are we too far from the birth of Christ? I realize sometimes scripture goes ahead, but in a timeline, should we be that far from Christ, his birth? No. So, there's something that every Jewish couple had to do to their male-born child on the eighth day. They had to take him where? And again, circumcised at the big building, the temple. And we know that in Luke chapter 2, or I hope we do, that Mary and Joseph didn't just have them circumcised, they, they, but they offered up an offering by doing, performing all these actions, going to the temple, by having Jesus Christ circumcised, by offering up two turtle doves, which was the offering for a poor couple to offer. These are all things that the law dictated. So by doing these things, we know that Mary and Joseph not only were under the law, but they abided by the law. But Christ did not just come 
to do away with the law, but he came to fulfill the law. What does Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17 say? Matthew 5, 17. Now, if you would have a red letter edition Bible, what color would the letter be, brother? Red. They would be red because they're the words of Christ. Christ said, I did not come to do away with the law, but I came to fulfill the law. So he didn't come to break the Ten Commandments like Moses did, literally, and do away with everything and abolish it and say, this is what I say and this is how I go because we've all been in workplaces probably that this is the rule and this is how we're supposed to do things and then a boss comes in and says, no, we're not doing it that way. We're doing it this way. They do whatever they want. That's not what Christ is doing here. Christ is saying, this is the law. I have not come to do away with it, but the law was a picture of me who was to come later. And that shouldn't surprise us as Christians because we have the New Testament. We have the Old Testament. We've had it studied for years and years and years, whether we sat in Sunday school, whether we sat in a midweek service, whether we sat under somebody just teaching, whether we studied down ourselves. We know that there are types of Jesus Christ throughout the New Old Testament. Isaac was a type of Christ. Melchizedek, the high priest of Salem that Abraham went to, was a type of Christ. We can look in the Old Testament and see connections between Islam and Ishmael. And we can see where things point to it. So it's not an uh, observe, I, observe, observe, I can't speak. It's not completely ridiculous that Jesus Christ, that the law was a picture of him, of him to come. But Christ did not come to do away with it. He came to fulfill it. And how do we know that? Because Christ did not break the law in all his years on the earth. He abided by it just like his parents did. If someone wants to read Matthew 23, 23. Matthew 23, 23. So what is Christ doing right here? He's not going against the law, but he's rebuking those that broke the law. He said, this is the way it's supposed to be, but you're not doing it that way. So Christ didn't say that I came to do away with the whole law completely, but he came to fulfill the law. And we see that throughout his lifetime, that at no point does he say that the law says this, but I say you do this. He didn't contradict it, but rather when the law was broken, he upheld what the law said. And there's many other verses that you can look at, but we're not going to read them for the sake of time. That's why you have notes, because I want you to see where I'm coming from. Plus, these are my study notes. If you ever want to go back and say, where is this? You can see for yourself. But Christ did not come to fulfill, do away with the law, but he came to fulfill the law. When we look at the two, the church and the law, who instituted the law? What human figure instituted the law? Moses. Moses did. He came down off Mount Sinai with the tablets. He's the one that instructed the people. But Christ came along, fulfilled the law, and he instituted what? We, that big old G word that we love. That's five letters. Grace. He instituted grace. So under the, and it's important to realize that because which is better? Is it better for to be under the law, where if you look upon a woman and you're fine? If you commit the act, then you're in a different boat because we're going to take you outside and stone you. Or is it better to be under grace? Which is easier to follow? Because Jesus said if you even look at a woman. You know, that is one of the big questions when it comes to Christian love. Is it easier to be under the law or under grace? But what does John chapter 1 and verse 17 state? And if someone else wants to find Galatians 3.24. So John 1.17 and Galatians 3.24. The law 
was given by Moses, but grace and the truth came by Jesus Christ. So the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was truth. The law spoke and pointed to Christ. But what was the purpose of the law in the first place? We know that Christ fulfilled the law, but there is a reason why God does things. There really is. Even all the way back, if we go to the Garden of Eden, for example, <coughs> when, Jesus, when God killed that innocent animal and shed its blood to make those coats, there was a reason for it. And he, from the very beginning, he was pointing to an innocent sacrifice that needed to be bloodshed, where there needed to be bloodshed as a result of sin. Now, when it comes to the law, what's the purpose of the law? Why did God institute the law in the first place? What does Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24 state? Before the law was our school master, the word was of Christ. So the law, that thing that is so difficult to follow, why must we have all these rules and regulations? Yada, yada, yada. Why can't I go here? Why can't I go there? Because all those things in the law was to bring us to Christ. And as a side note, all those things in the New Testament is to separate us from the world and to bring us into a greater fellowship with Jesus Christ. I know I'm going down a rabbit trail, but we have, cannot forget, we cannot forget who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place. It's not going to be just anybody. But the Bible, the word, the truth, the law is all to separate unto God a holy people. A royal priesthood. I heard this in a, I was listening to somebody preach this last week, and they kind of brought it out, and my mind kind of watered a little bit. It happens sometimes. But think about this. If you were a king, and you were, or a queen, and you ruled a country, would you take a thief or a murderer out of the prisons and share your throne with them? Say, here you go. You can share my throne. You have the same power, authority. Everything I have is yours. If you wouldn't do that, why should Christ share his throne with somebody who's compromised time and time again, who is not living right? Someone who is not clean and someone who is not holy. Because the Bible is constantly pulling for a church without spot, without wrinkle. A holy church. And we'll probably come across that here in a little bit too, but getting ahead of myself. But the whole purpose of the law was to bring us to Christ. And the law had to make a way for Christ. Remember, the dispensation of the law began with Moses when they were ended, and they ended with Christ dying on the cross. The age of the church began at the cross, and began with Jesus Christ because he died on the cross, and continued until this present age. So, the law had to make a way for Christ because there is a transition that is about to occur. There was a transition from the law to grace, and it occurred at one location, and that is the cross. I will go ahead and read Galatians chapter 3. If you want to turn there, you may. Galatians chapter 3, and we will, read, we will read from 13 to 29. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for, for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man dis disannulleth or addeth thereunto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and deceives as, as of many, but as of one, and to the, thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, 
cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if Christ, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the whole promise was to bring us to Christ. And when we come to Christ, we know that it's only by faith. But the law had to make that transition. For starters, and I didn't see this before, and I took my finger off the verse, but the verse said that we could not fulfill the law. And the reason being is it would have made us righteous in ourselves. And we all know what our own righteousness is. It's us filthy rags. And I... Let me flip over to Ephesians because I know it's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I cannot remember what it states, though. But Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, the Bible states, concerning righteousness. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So if we would have been able to become righteous through the law, it would have been our own actions. It would have been our own righteousness. And then every man could have boasted, well, I did this to get saved. I did this to get into heaven. What did you do to get here? But that was not God's plan in the first place. Righteousness is not our righteousness. Salvation is not something that we can obtain through works. But God made sure, and it was, we read the passage here, he made sure once again that it was through faith. Through faith in Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we come back to that phrase that if we could do it on our own, we would boast of it. And then we become prideful. But that was not the case. The law served to point us to Christ, and the law made a way for Christ. And the law, and there was that transition at the cross from the law to grace. And that transition occurred when he said, it is finished, gave up the ghost, and on the third day, he rose again. Again, the sacrifice was made at the cross, but we cannot ever forget, when it comes to Christianity, that the verification that he was Lord came <coughs> in the morning, the resurrection. The sacrifice and the resurrection go hand in hand. Without the resurrection, there is no viable sacrifice. Without the resurrection, there is no viable taking on the stripes of his back for our healing. The resurrection is what verified everything. But it's the work of the cross that made the transition from law to grace. Because it's at that point where the sacrifice was killed. And if we want to argue and go back and forth, we can. And we can argue even that the sacrifice wasn't fully done and that the transition didn't occur until after Mary Magdalene had her garden experience. These are minor technicalities. But really, when we look at Mary Magdalene in the garden, Jesus Christ is something that pops out 
for anyone who knows the temple and has studied the sacrifice, especially the sin sacrifice and the high priest. And Jesus told her one thing not to do. And what did Jesus tell Mary not to do? Keep your hands off that. Don't. Don't touch that. Jesus told Mary Magdalene in the garden, don't touch me, for I have not done what? Ascended to the Father. We know that the tabernacle was a type and a shadow of things in heaven. Why would Jesus have to ascend to heaven to present his innocent blood before the Father for the acceptable sacrifice? On the day of, I think it was the day of atonement, when the sin sacrifice was performed, and that blood was in that wall, when the high priest was making himself, making his way up those stairs, into the temple, through the temple, and into the Holy of Holies, no one was allowed to touch him. Otherwise, the whole sin sacrifice would have been defiled. Jesus Christ told Mary not to touch him. Why? Because he had not yet ascended to the Father. He had not yet presented the sin, the offering from the sin sacrifice to the Father. So where do you want to make the transition? The argument doesn't really matter. The point of the matter is the word of Christ on the cross separates the age of the law from the age of the church. And when we look at the church, We've already looked at the two uh, places where it occurs in the New Testament. But the word church appears 79, in 79 verses of the New Testament. The word church was translated from the Greek word ecclesia. In 78 verses out of the 79, the Greek word used for the word church was ecclesia. In 1 Peter 5.13, we do find that word ecclesia used, but there was no... Well, I should say in 1 Peter 5.13, the, the word church was not translated ecclesia. It appears in this verse, the KJV authors placed it in italics. What do we know about italics in the King James Version of the Bible? They were the words added to the Bible or the text by the translators, and the whole purpose for it wasn't to change the meaning of the verse, but it was to add better understanding so we knew exactly what was being discussed. So according to Strong's Greek Dictionary, Ecclesia means a calling out, concretely a popular meeting, especially a religious congregation, whether it be a Jewish synagogue or a Christian community, or an assembly. And when we break it down, in essence, the word ecclesia means simply this, call it out. If we would go back in our minds and pass the preaching, I'm sure we would, throughout the years, remember this being mentioned, that the word church means called out one. The word ecclesia occurs in 115 verses of the New Testament. This word was translated the church, the church, to the church, of the church, the churches, assembly in Acts 19.39. And that's the only verse you'll find the word that was assembly where it was translated. Churches, to the church, and in 2 Corinthians 1.1 1, 1 is the only place we find unto the churches. But it's very important that we realize that as a church, the meaning church, where it's derived from, means called out. And we've already discussed this to some degree this morning because we are not part of this world. We are distinct from this world. We already had the discussion, if you were king or queen, would you share your throne with a murderer or a thief or anything along those nature? Would you say, go down to the dungeon and get me somebody I can share my throne with? No. We can't trust them. We don't know what they're like. So why should God share his throne with somebody who's constantly compromising, someone who's not living right, someone who's doing whatever they want and think that they're on the way to going to heaven? He's not going to. We already know this. Scripture tells us this. There will be many on this day that say, Lord, Lord, have we not done this? Have we not done that? But God is looking for a true church, those that are called out. God's people 
were never meant to be part of this world. Would someone please read 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. Do you not think when we go together with unbelievers for what fellowship has purposes with unbelievers and what communication has laid with darkness? For what platform have Christ with blood? Or what hath he that believes with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with others? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them.
because they would have saw the enemy and they would have wanted to go back to Egypt. So God took them out the hard way because the whole point was they had to be separate from the world. God gave them a land of their own. They were a country of their own. They were a nation of their own as we'll see in the wilderness they become. But what happens when Moses is up on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments from God? It'd be better if we were back in Egypt. Joshua, we should go back to Egypt. Let's leave Moses up there. Okay, I know they didn't say that, but their hearts were back in Egypt. You know what? Moses is gone. We don't know what happened. Let's make us a God to worship. And where did they get the idea for that God to worship? Where did that God come from? Where did his image come from? You want to take a guess? Nathan. What's that? Nathan. Physical location would be back in Egypt. Because they knew what they saw back in Egypt. You know what? Let's have ourselves a little bit of Egypt right here and right now. And they not only made themselves a god like Egypt, but they worshipped like a bunch of Egyptians. In that pagan lifestyle, that wasn't God's plan. God was up on the mountain giving his instructions and his plan to his holy man and how to lead his holy people to give him instruction to go forward, to be separate from the world, and they're down there being part of the world. God's plan was never for his people to be part of the world but they were to be separate. Stephen made reference to the church in the wilderness in Acts 7.38. They were separate from the Egyptians. They were separate from everybody else. And why did the Jews ever get mixed in with the world in the first place? When it came to Abraham and Isaac, it was because of A, a lack of faith. They went to where it was plenty of some prosperous. <coughs> they went down to Egypt during time of famine. But when it comes to present day, the reason the Jews are mixed in the world so much is because they never left the world alone. The world was always part of them. The reason they went into the Babylonian captivity was because of the hardness of the heart, because of one great sin that kept following them, that they kept going back to. Do you remember what that sin was? Adultery. Idolatry. Idolatry, idol worship. Oh. And where do they get this idol worship from? The world. And because of their disobedience, because of their idol worship, God said, you know what? That's fine. I'm going to let the Babylonians take over. <gasps> You're not to be part of them. But as punishment, they're going to conquer you. And we'll find that remnant that was always looking and waiting. They knew the words of Jeremiah, how it should only last 70 years, perhaps. And they knew it was going to last forever. But there were Jews that made permanent remnant residence in Babylon. In fact, there were Jews just taken captive in Babylon. But before that, we know that Pharaoh came up and took some of them captive. And took them down to Egypt. And you know what they did in Egypt? Some of them stayed there. In fact... They built synagogues. Because guess which portion Mary and Joseph probably fled to in Egypt when persecution came and Herod came to kill the babies. And the wise men warned them. Probably to that remnant of Jews that were left in Egypt. And why were they there? Because they never left the world. God's constantly looking for a people that are called out. Even during the Babylonian captivity, there were men like Nehemiah that longed to be back in their homeland, that wanted to go back. And even in this present day and age, there are Jews that want to go back to Israel. Some of them may not know why, but I can tell you why. It's the fulfillment of prophecy. It is the valley of dry bones coming together. It is the, they are the Jews returning to Israel. Why? Because God's plan for the Jew was never to be part of this world. It was to be separate. And the same thing goes from the church. He tells us to come out from among them and be separate. He call, God is always calling for a separate people. And we can reverse that verse they're all your notes. But God's not looking for people that are mixed in with this world. 
He's looking for a people that have kept themselves that have kept themselves pure and holy and separate. The sad part is, if we would look at the church world today, the majority of them are involved with the world. How do we win the world? Well, we become like the world. How do we get more young people into church? Well, we start holding dances and stuff. That's not God's design. How do we get more and more people into church in February? Well, let's show the Super Bowl poll on this big screen in the sanctuary of all places. God's design for the church was never to be part of the world, but to be separate from the world. We cannot win the world if we are living in the world. We need to be separate, and that is the church that God is looking for. Because if we do not make sure that we are doing everything we can to be separate from the world, and I am not talking about extremes. There were people in the past that they would have their little pillar, and they would live on top of that little pillar because that's how they were keeping away from materialism and the world and trying to be so far. And then they got to a competition where this person's pillar was higher than this person's pillar, and yada, yada, yada. There are things we have to do in this world. And I'm not saying that we do evil things, but we have to work. We have to interact to some degree with people. In fact, the Bible never tells us to shut the world off. But yet the Bible says to go out and win the world. Not with worldly means, but go out and buy them a church. Tell them about Christ. Witness to them. <coughs> Witness to them. But we are never meant to be part of the world system. And if we are part of this world system, and we can go down, I think it's Galatians chapter 5, and there's another passage. What should I go through? I call the big sin list, where the Bible says we're drunkards and liars and witchcraft and all this yada yada yada. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God or enter into the kingdom of God or enter into heaven. If we're doing any of those things, it's not just a matter of, well, when I die, am I going to hear, depart from me, that worker of iniquity? But Jesus Christ is coming back at any moment. And if we are caught up in this world system, living like the world, talking like the world, acting like the world, then don't be surprised when the lightning flashes in the eastern sky and we're left behind. Because all along, from the moment that we say, Jesus, I confess my sins come in my heart, and, I'm, and the big part is, I'm never going to do it again. Why are we making that commitment? Because we are coming out from the world and being separate. We are now Jesus Christ. And that is a big thing we need to realize because we have it easy in America. When it comes to even just water baptism, water baptism does nothing for us spiritually. It is a command that we are supposed to follow. And what it does is it shows a separation between us and the world. The old man has died, the old sinful man, and I am now going to live a new in Christ. And you realize that there are people in foreign lands that the moment they are baptized in water baptism, not the confession of faith itself in Jesus Christ, but water baptism by itself, that their family cuts them off and excommunicates them, their community excommunicates them. And sometimes the government kills them because they are making a stance that this is where I stand. I am God's. I am going to come out from among them and be separate. When we, as we begin our study on the church, Christ did not come to do away with the law, but he came to fulfill the law. The law pointed to Christ, and when we look at the church, the people that Christ is coming back for is a church without spot, without wrinkle. That is a church that has separated themselves from the world and said, God, I don't know what everybody else is going to do, but I'm going to do my best to live holy, to live clean, to make sure that I am separated unto you. God, I want to get as close to you as possible, because when we look at this Christian walk, it's not another religion. There are so many different religions in this world. But technically, ours isn't a religion. It's not a matter of how far can we go in the Bible, how much do we know in the Bible, how much have we have memorized. But it is a walk with Jesus Christ. Why do we read the Bible? Why do we pray? Why do we pray over what we read in the Bible? Because it is allowing the Holy Ghost to change us into the very image of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ didn't come to establish another religion. He came that we may be transformed into his very image. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus.
Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. It's all about being transformed to the very image of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and would do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, Lord, we pray that you just keep this place clear of any works of the enemy, Lord. I pray that none of the enemy would be brought in with anyone today, and may we not entertain them, Lord, but may we keep our minds fixated on you. May we keep our hearts fixated on you, Lord, that we may obtain what you have for us today, that we may be transformed even, even, even farther into your very image, because you alone are holy and you alone are worthy, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leader and the musicians, Lord, as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing. Anoint the preacher today as he brings forth your word. Anoint his mind and his lips that your word would flow forth like never before. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be in one mindset and one accord. That the work of the Holy Ghost would not be hindered, but that he may move freely, Lord. And that we would allow him to work in each of our lives, changing us, Lord, into your very image. Even if it would be uncomfortable, Lord, I pray that we would be willing to surrender to you like never before. That you would be able to have your way fully in our lives. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus and everyone said, Amen.